Thanks very much, Jackie, for really giving us some insight into uh, resource poor settings and the challenge that we have there. And for the last speaker in this uh, session, um, we're going to ask uh, Andrew Menti, who's a, a well-known nutri nutrition researcher, to uh, discuss the concept of rethinking what we mean by a healthy diet. Um, there you go. Thank you very much, Dr. Gerstein, Dr. Youssef. Uh, today, I'll uh, present some of the ongoing work we're conducting on uh, diet and chronic disease and how uh, our work strongly challenges conventional thinking on diet for populations around the world. Now, the uh, current dietary recommendations for uh, diet and chronic disease prevention stem from the diet heart hypothesis, which was first proposed back in the 1950s it still drives dietary policy up to the present day. So the hypothesis states that total fat intake and uh, particularly saturated fat intake uh, raises blood cholesterol levels and primarily LDL cholesterol. And higher LDL increases coronary heart disease. Therefore, if we reduce fat intake in the population and saturated fat, of which the primary sources are uh, whole fat dairy and meat, that will also reduce coronary heart disease in the population as well. Now, uh, and as I mentioned, this drives dietary policy for, for decades and has been around despite the science of nutrition evolving over the years. Now, of course, this assumes that fats affect only cholesterol and have no other effects on any other biological systems in the body. But as it turns out, it doesn't quite work that way. Now, uh, there, there are a number of systematic reviews on a saturated fat and uh, clinical events. Uh, here's one conducted in 2015 uh, by um, our group looking at fat and uh, coronary heart disease or various outcomes in the systematic review. And uh, you can see the uh, estimates of association are statistically neutral, comparing people the highest to lowest saturated fat consumers. So no association between saturated fat and clinical events in cohort studies. Now there are actually randomized trials of saturated fat replacement with polyunsaturated fat. They're mostly small trials, but a few did look at the replacement or direct test of the diet heart hypothesis. As you can see, when you look at the data collectively, again, the results are uh, statistically neutral. Now, most of the work that, we, that has been conducted to, up to now has been primarily in high-income countries, namely North America and Europe, with a few studies in Japan and China. Uh, so, uh, this, so it's a good time here to introduce PURE, which uh, of course captures um, five continents of the world. In this analysis, 147,000 people in 21 phase one countries on five continents. And so what we do here is we capture a broad range of intake and diet diversity. So we look at uh, both from low intake to high intake, we can characterize shapes of association between nutrients and foods and clinical events and with uh, big numbers in ways that has never been possible previously in any study. So this slide here shows uh, the risk of mortality by uh, type, of, uh, type of fat, saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fat. You can see each type of fat we found is associated with uh, a lower risk of mortality all the way up to the highest quintile of fat and the results are consistent for each uh, type of fat. Now, taking saturated fat at the top there, looking at the quintile of uh, intake, you see that the mean saturated fat intake ranges from 3% of energy in the lowest quintile to 13% um, of energy in the highest quintile. So uh, what we have here is that we're the highest fat consuming group is about the average intake in Western populations, about 13% of energy. Whereas most of the other uh, participants around the world consume lower amounts, lower than what we consume in Western countries, with the lowest quintile at 3% of energy. So this is a very low amount of saturated fat consumed in the uh, global population here, lower than in Western countries, and never has been characterized in previous studies. And, and so these results not only challenge conventional thinking on saturated fat and what might be an optimal diet, but also uh, suggest that findings from previous studies may not be globally applicable. 
Now, by contrast, for carbohydrates, we find higher consumption exceeding about 60% of energy is associated with increased risk of mortality. Now, uh, the carbohydrate consumption in participants uh, in the various countries around the world is primarily from refined carbohydrates or refined wheat products, not from fruits and vegetables. So this increased risk that we see here is mainly refined uh, carbohydrates. And uh, now in more recent years, there's been a shift in focus from nutrients uh, to foods and food patterns. And uh, to date, by far the most robust data we have on nutrition and cardiovascular events, it comes from studies looking at fruits and vegetables, which we, there's good consensus that they're generally protective. And this is mainly from studies conducted in North America, Europe, China, and Japan. So we looked at the risk here, risk of mortality and major cardiovascular disease by fruit, vegetable, and legume intake in pure. And you see on the left, higher fruit vegetable consumption is associated with a lower risk of mortality from uh, up to about three to four servings per day. And then the risk is constant up to uh, eight servings per day. And for major CVD, we see also a, a trend for a, a uh, protective association, though the result is not statistically significant. When you take out cooked vegetables, then it's, it's more marked. So uh, our findings uh, support previous uh, recommendations, on, recommendations on fruits and vegetables. Now, for other dietary exposures, other foods and other and dietary patterns in general, the evidence is, is far less robust and it generally is inconsistent and inconclusive. This includes uh, individual foods like grains, fish, dairy, and meats and some uh, well-known dietary patterns like DASH and Alternative Healthy Eating Index, which is a measure of USDA dietary guidelines. So here's one example of a study that just came out in a British medical journal where they looked at, um, they compared various eating patterns uh, versus ischemic heart disease and stroke. So what they found here is that, this is looking at data from Epic Oxford, um, where they found that vegetarians had uh, a significantly lower risk of ischemic heart disease compared to the meat eaters, about a 22% lower risk. But by the, on, on the flip side, they found an increased risk of stroke. This is in the same group of participants in the study. So on the one hand, you get the diet that increases risk of ischemic heart disease or associated with increased risk, but also associated with, with, a, with a decreased risk of, or an increased risk of stroke. So you get these competing associations with different outcomes. So this strongly challenges the current uh, recommendations on the, this uh, diet that's growing in popularity. Now, natural sources of saturated fat, like dairy and meats, also contain uh, a number of other nutrients that are known to be beneficial, that, are, that our bodies need for good health, including essential amino acids, monounsaturated fat as found in olive oil, B vitamins, including B12, which is found mainly in animal products, a variety of minerals, and vitamin D. And so uh, recommending low amounts of uh, these whole foods in populations with undernutrition uh, may possibly be unwise. So last year we looked at uh, the association of dairy intake with uh, cardiovascular events and mortality in pure. This graph here shows mean total dairy intake and whole fat and low fat dairy intake overall and by region. Now on the left, just wanted to bring your attention here where total dairy is light yellow, um, whole fat dairy is, is orange, or supposed to be orange, and low fat da dairy is shown in red. Now overall, there's about 170 gram intake of dairy, which is about one serving a day globally. And um, there's about twice as much whole fat dairy consumed as low fat. But uh, what you see here is marked uh, variation across regions where in North America, South America, and the Middle East, uh, there's a, a markedly higher intake of dairy. Whereas by contrast in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and China, there's a markedly lower intake of dairy. And you also note that whole fat dairy is consumed more widely uh, around the world than low fat dairy, with the exception of North America and Europe, where people consume more low fat dairy than whole fat dairy. Uh, 
Now, we looked at the association of dairy with clinical outcomes in cure and looking at the various outcomes composite of death or CBD, mortality, and major cardiovascular disease, we see an inverse association where higher dairy intake is associated with a lower risk of outcome events all the way up to about two servings of dairy per day with between a 15 to 20 percent lower risk than those with the highest group compared to the people, the lowest consumers. So this strongly challenges conventional thinking as well. For that, we, when we look at whole fat dairy uh, versus uh, low fat dairy, we find that the, the effect is mainly driven by consumption of whole fat dairy, where you can see the signal is much more marked, more pronounced for each outcome. Whereas by contrast, when you look at whole fat combined with low fat, the inverse association is, is, is much more modest. So uh, whole fat dairy appears to be the main driver of the observed protective effect of, of uh, dairy intake. And that strongly, again, challenges conventional thinking because the recommendation is to replace whole fat dairy with low fat dairy. Now, uh, in our, uh, some of the, our current focus is looking at uh, red meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and nuts versus risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. And our main focus is to develop a global healthy diet score that we can apply globally in populations around the world that could be predictive of major chronic diseases and therefore in, help to better inform diets around the world. Now, our knowledge of uh, healthy diet scores comes uh, again largely from uh, studies conducted in Western populations. So many of you might know some of these common diet scores, there are many diet scores out there, but some of the common ones are DASH, Mediterranean diet, the healthy eating index, the planetary, more recently, the planetary diet score, which um, uh, takes into account uh, our, our concern for the environment and, uh, and, and assess, assessing these versus clinical outcomes. Uh, now, the major problem in high income countries is excess intake of some foods like dairy and meats. But it's not known if the conclusions derived from studies conducted in high-income countries are applicable to, to other world regions, including places where dairy and meats are often consumed in very low amounts, like Africa and South Asia, for example. And there's no diet score that has focused exclusively on protective foods. Most diet scores mix uh, protective foods with harmful foods, where they reward higher intake of protective foods and, and give you a lower score if you eat more harmful foods. Uh, whereas, uh, but with the recent focus on protective foods, it's important to develop a score that focuses on protective foods alone, particularly given that consumption of protective foods is not correlated with harmful foods. So it's important to look at them separately. And no diet score uh, has focused exclusively on protective foods. Now, all previous diet scores, including these common ones used here, um, uh, uh, look at fruit, vegetable, legume, nuts, and fish consumption. None of these emphasize higher intake of whole fat dairy or unprocessed meat as beneficial elements in the score. So our central hypothesis is that non-communicable disease may be caused by a diet comprised of low amounts of several natural or minimally processed foods, including fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and fish, as also characterized in other diet scores, but also low amounts of dairy, especially whole fat dairy and unprocessed meats. So our objectives are to develop a uh, diet score incorporating this recent evidence from a large cohort study, PURE, involving over 147,000 people from 21 countries on five continents, validate the score in three independent prospective studies of vascular patients or high-risk individuals, and two international case control studies of MI and stroke, and assess whether the peer diet score is applicable to people from different economic regions and geographic regions around the world, and those with and without vascular disease. So we looked at data from six large international studies, 244,000 people, in fact, spanning 80 countries around the world. Um, three of the studies are perspective, pure, on-target, transcendent origin, uh, while two are uh, case control studies, interheart and interstroke. Um, one of the studies, pure, focuses on general populations, generally healthy people living in communities, 
on target and transcend focus on vascular patients or high risk individuals and um, interheart and inter stroke are case control studies of MI and stroke respectively. Note the big number of events that we have uh, across the different studies. Three of the studies are global, while on-target transit and origin cover North and South America, Europe, and Asia. So we capture um, broad patterns of diet globally, and we have big numbers to um, inform diets around the world. So first we developed our uh, healthy diet score based on foods that are associated with a lower risk of mortality in a global cohort, such as pure 21 countries and five continents. And we found that the foods associated with lower risk of mortality include vegetables, fruits, and legumes, nuts, fish, but also include dairy, which is mainly whole fat dairy, and unprocessed red meat and white meat. And in the scoring scheme, we use a similar scoring scheme as used in other studies of diet scores like the Mediterranean diet, where we reward people for consuming higher amounts and uh, give them a lower score if they consume lower amounts than the population median. So the score ranges from zero to eight, where eight, eight is the maximum score representing the healthiest diet. Now this slide shows what a low and high pure healthy diet score looks like. On the left, you see an unhealthy diet, uh, with the lowest quintile of the diet score and the food and nutrient composition. And on the right, you see the highest quintile of the diet score representing the healthiest diet and the nutrient and food composition. So look, taking the unhealthy diet first on the left, you see that the average intake of fruits and vegetables is about one serving a day, 0.3 servings of uh, nuts and legumes, 0.3 dairy, and meat is consumed about like less than once a week and fish is also seldomly consumed. Note the very high carbohydrate intake, 69% of energy from carbs, and that's mainly, again, refined carbohydrates, uh, not fruits and vegetables, uh, and the low intake of fat, less than 20% of energy. So anyone would, would, would say that this is a very high carb, low fat diet that's consumed though, among those in the lowest diet score group. Those in the highest diet score group eat about four and a half servings of fruits and vegetables, one and a half servings of nuts and legumes, and consume markedly more amounts of dairy and red meat and fish. And this is a more moderate diet, a more balanced diet, about 54% of energy from carbs, close to 30% from fat. So this is a, a diet that avoids extremes, a, a, that includes a variety of foods, all in moderate amounts. This is not a fat diet or an extreme uh, you know, keto or, or paleo diet. It, instead, it's, it's a regular diet. It includes a variety of foods in moderate amounts. So this slide here shows the participant characteristics uh, by pure healthy diet score, looking at the quintiles of the diet score and the various characteristics. So I want to bring your attention to two of the uh, variables, BMI and energy intake. So note that with the higher diet score, we see that energy intake increases uh, in a graded fashion um, by a uh, large amount from about 1,700 uh, calories to about 2,600 calories from lowest to highest uh, in, uh, diet score groups. So that's a marked increase in energy intake. And also note BMI also increases from 24 to 27 in a graded fashion, again, from lowest to highest quintile. So note that um, a lower qual diet quality score suggests uh, that people have a lower body weight and also lower energy intake. And so these are not adjusted for any variable or geographic region. So this is largely depicting parts of the world where people consume lower amounts of energy and uh, have lower uh, body weight. It was also suggested in, in a few of the talks yesterday. Now this slide here, it's a very simple slide, but has an important message. It shows the pure healthy diet score by the GDP, country GDP level the low income countries all the way up to the high income countries. And you see that the mean diet score increases uh, in a graded fashion and strongly with higher country GDP with an average diet score of only 2.5 in, lo in the low income countries compared to an average diet score of 5.5 in the high income countries. That's a marked difference in the diet score, meaning that the that people in low-income countries eat very low amounts of these foods, fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and fish, but also low amounts of dairy and red meat. Now this slide shows the risk of mortality by healthy diet score in pure, 
and looking at the quintiles of the diet score, the number of events, and the number of participants, you see the, the proportion of people who die with higher diet score is lower in a graded fashion, all the way up to the highest diet score quintile. In the minimally adjusted model, we see a graded association with lower risk all the way up to the highest quintile with a hazard ratio of 0.56, after full multivariable adjustment for social demographic characteristics, uh, lifestyle factors and comorbidities, we see a hazard ratio of 0.75 in the highest quintile uh, compared to the lowest quintile. With uh, about a 7% lower risk of mortality per 20 percentile increment in the diet score. Then we took the same diet score and we applied it to four international cohort studies, pure, on target, transcend, and origin uh, for three outcomes here, looking at total mortality, major CVD, and the composite of major CVD or death. And you can see there's consistent results uh, across the uh, different studies and for each outcome, where the uh, per 20 percent increment in the diet score is about a 7 percent lower risk of total mortality and about a 6 percent lower risk of major cardiovascular disease. And uh, when we apply the score to InterHeart, an, uh, an international case control study, we again see a similar pattern of results in the full multivariable adjustment, about a 22% lower risk in the highest compared to the lowest group. And a similar pattern is found in InterStroke, another international case control study of stroke. Now, um, what's interesting is that when we look at the association of the diet score with the composite of CBD or death, we find that there is a consistent protective association across different economic regions, low income, middle income, and high income regions. However, the association is, is markedly more pronounced in the low income countries compared to the uh, high income countries with a much steeper association among low income countries. This is an important message because it suggests that you get bigger bang for your buck if we were to improve the diet in low income countries and increase the availability of, and affordability of fruits, vegetables, legumes, but also meats and dairy in these countries around the world, then there would be much more marked um, benefit uh, as far as uh, cardiovascular disease and mortality is concerned based on this, these um, observational data. So that's an important message that, that hasn't been considered at all by previous dietary recommendations. As they assume a one size fits all uh, philosophy with, with regard to diet. So to conclude, the pure diet score comprised a higher intake of these foods, but which also includes dairy and meats is associated with a lower risk of mortality and cardiovascular disease globally. And the associations are found in all world regions and are, but are most pronounced in low income countries. There's consistency across four large international studies uh, using different study designs and study populations and consistency in those with and without vascular disease. So some elements of the diet score, like whole fat dairy and unprocessed meats, uh, challenge the current, current conventional thinking of, uh, of what we think of as a healthy diet, but in this case, applied globally around the world. Now for future directions, our aim is to uh, help to solidify causal connections between diet and non-communicable disease. That. Okay, oh, just one minute. Just one minute. Okay. Okay. No, okay. Oh, okay, it was not. Uh, and, and, uh, and so we, we uh, will introduce advanced methods, uh, genetics, metabolomics, and proteinomics to uh, identify uh, mechanisms linking diet to chronic disease, metabolome and proteome to identify new pathways and surrogate markers that could be used for randomized trials and potentially new, uh, developing new drugs for chronic disease prevention and genetic data for, uh, to conduct Mendelian randomization to help solidify uh, the association that we observe in, in observational studies. And also to look at new outcomes, chronic uh, congestive heart failure, lung diseases, uh, cognition and dementia, frailty, individual and individual cancers, uh, including breast, colon, lung, and prostate cancer. Uh, so it's essential to con continue the uh, long-term follow-up of a study like CURE to ensure that we have uh, an adequate number of events over the next five to 10 years so that we can look at association with these new novel uh, outcomes. So uh, 
so thank you very much. I'll conclude with the, some of the happy faces and the great people that are participating in PURE. Thank you very much. Thank you.